All right, so we're going to look at this acronym a little closer. Um, let me see. If you want to turn to, let me see where it is. You want to turn to Luke 11, you can turn to Luke 11, and we'll get to that in just a little while. Um, so we're going to look at this acronym in uh, Robbie's book. Uh, the book is Growing Up, Disciples Making Disciples. And it's closer. The acronym is closer. And the first C we introduced last week, the C stands for communication, which, of course, what we're talking about here is we're talking about prayer. Now, last week we went through the Lord's Prayer and we saw some components of prayer. We saw that the Lord's Prayer isn't something that we just recite out of, out of you know, vain, repetitious habit. It's something that we, you know, if we want to recite the Lord's Prayer and quote the Lord's Prayer, there's nothing wrong with that as long as it doesn't become meaningless ritual. We saw that it's more like the modern prayer. We broke the prayer down. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we talked about the different steps, the components of the model prayer. And that's praise, purpose, provision, pardon, protection, and praise. And that's kind of the components of what makes up the model prayer. So we finished those and now we're moving on to the commands of prayer. And we were able to touch on the first one last week. And the first command of prayer was Pray persistently, pray persistently. Luke eleven nine 9 says, and I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you. You know, mo most Christians were not persistent. We, we kind of pray randomly. We pray I irregularly. We, we pray lazily. We pray in an undisciplined way. We need to understand what persistence means. When we pray, it is those persistent prayers that God hears, like the woman calling out to the judge over and over and over. And he finally answered the woman's prayer just so she would leave him alone. And then God said, pray to me that way. That's amazing. <laughs> because we, you know, it shows us we're not God. You know, I punch somebody in the face, they bother me that much, but I'm glad I'm not God. So this woman badgers this judge over and over and over. And then at the end of the parable, Jesus says, pray like that. You know, just keep going to and pray persistently. Be persistent with it. So this week we're moving on to the second command to pray. And the second command in prayer is to pray privately. So pray persistently and now we're pray privately. Let me read for you Matthew 6, 6. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room Close your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Listen, I don't have to tell you this. Life is busy. Sometimes the phone is ringing off the hook. The TV is blaring. The kids are fighting. The dog is yapping. And you ask yourself, how in the world am I ever going to find time to get alone with God and pray privately. Do you understand how busy my day is? I don't have time to go and find a, time, a place off by myself and pray privately throughout the day. Well, we have to make time. We have to carve out time in our schedule to pray privately. We have to carve out time to get alone with God. You know, there's an old saying, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. You have to plan time. You have to schedule that time alone with God. You see, we prioritize things in our lives according to what's important to us. You know, if, if something is important enough to you, you're going to find time to do it. If I go record that TV show that I want to watch, I'm going to find time to watch my show. Then why can't I find time to get alone and pray to the Lord? What's our priorities like? Um, if something is important enough to, to you, you're going to find time to do it. Now, how often do we 
do we do that? How often do we get away from the craziness of this world and, and get alone? How often do we go into our prayer closet? Where, where is your prayer? Somebody to ask you, where's your prayer closet? What, what are you going to tell them? Where is that in a room? And it ain't even got to be in your house. Years ago, I had an old public school desk that my parents owned 80 acres of pasture land. I, I got that old desk and I carried it all the way to the back 40 and put it under a, a, a row of trees overlooking the next pasture over. And, you know, you could come up and see the sunset. And I was like, man, that's a cool place to pray. So I used that for a few months. And then I seen a snake and I never went back there again. In fact, I think that desk is still back there because I never went back to, to, you know, I cleared that barbed wire fence to get away from that snake. I don't do snakes. But you got to find a place to get alone with God. Jesus modeled that for us all the time. What did Jesus do? He went to get alone with God. And a lot of times it was out in nature. He would go out in nature and connect with God. That's a good place to connect with God at. But Jesus modeled that for us. He all the time would carve out time. Didn't matter how busy his schedule was. Didn't matter what he was teaching the disciples. He found that time to go get alone with the Lord. It was a regular habit. A poor prayer life is a result of poor planning. Now something that Robbie suggests in his book is to consider the 7-Up method. The seven up method where how it works is like for the next seven days, you commit that when you wake up, you're going to pray for seven minutes. And, and then what happens is, and, and then you, you track your progress. You write down what time you started and started praying in your journal. You write down what time you stopped praying. Now, some of us might think, well, seven minutes, you know, that's, that's, that's not that bad. You know, it's well, seven minutes praying is longer than you think. Because, you know, you can ask people that have done this before. You can start out by saying, you know, I prayed for everybody. I prayed for myself. I prayed for my friends. I prayed for my family. I prayed for everybody that come to mind. And I thought, surely I'd pray for 10 minutes. And you look down at your watch and it's been four. And you pray for everybody you could think of. But, you know, we are, we are supposed to find that time to pray. And if you've ever spent seven continuous minutes in prayer, it's a it's a challenge at first, but then you'll get used to it. And that seven minutes will turn into 10, that 10 minutes will turn into 20 and maybe even any more. All right. The next command to pray is to pray publicly, pray publicly. The biblical model for prayer has always included participatory public prayer. Sometimes we like to use a fancy term. We call it corporate prayer. Okay. Um, think how often the apostles and the early church met together to pray. Acts 2.42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Acts 4.24, and when they heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of the Lord with boldness. They, the, the church, the early church, they got together. And they prayed together. That's what they did. I'm busy. I've, I've, got a, I've got a full schedule. I don't have time to come to the church and pray. Well, you know, years ago, you know, back in the day, you know, the, you just wasn't no thing to just walk to the local church and pray. Wasn't nothing just to walk to a neighbor's house and pray. But in this modern culture, you know, we've gotten used to driving miles and miles in traffic to attend church. So... That's a little bit harder to accomplish, but um, that's no excuse like everything else because it's a matter of priorities and it's a matter of commitment. If it's important to you, you'll find time to do it. If you're committed enough to it, you'll do it. 
Um, you know, it's funny that the same people that say that it's difficult to drive to a prayer meeting have no, no problem going to the gym, no problem going to the tanning bed, no problem going to Starbucks, no problem going down to Flowood and eating and coming back. And I do that all the time. I'll go down to Flowood, your restaurant, and come right back. It's nothing. 50 minutes? off. Oh, that ain't nothing, you know? So we say that, but what's, what's our priority? You know, when you're praying with a partner, say you've got a prayer partner, or you're in, in one of these discipleship groups that this book is about, and, you know, you're, you're, you're in one of these groups, you, you ask for requests, and then you t- take turns praying for one another. And, and everybody prays. And listen, I understand that, you know, people are busy. You know, it's sometimes it's impossible to go to the church in the middle of the day to pray. I understand that. But guess what God blessed us with? Modern technology. Did you know you have the capability in your pocket that you can video message? It's not just the Jetsons anymore. We can do this today. I mean, you can Skype, you can Zoom call, you can Facebook message video chat, you can FaceTime. There's an app on your phone that will allow you to do this. You can meet at any time and you're not, you're not limited by geography anymore. Anytime you want to stop and pray with somebody, you can pray with somebody. Say if you connected to two people a day and prayed with them, well in a week, that's 14 people you prayed with. And maybe that's a, maybe that's a lot. Well, if you just got one person away, you said, hey, look, at this time on this day, let's get together on a, on a face on a FaceTime call and let's pray together. Man, that's that's two people. That's two people more than you would have prayed with otherwise. So the next command is to pray precisely, pray precisely. And this is in we're going to look in Luke, Luke 11, uh, Luke eleven eleven. Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, will he not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, the purpose of this passage is to show us that God is a loving father who wants to give to his children what they desire. That, that is, that is the main truth of this passage. But there's a second truth here that's, that's, that's often overlooked. The son asked for something specific and the father gave him specifically what he asked for. The son asked for a fish. He got a fish. The son asked for an egg. He got an egg. You know, in in, in the same sermon, you know, earlier in the same sermon in Luke 11, you had the guy coming to the friend at midnight and saying, I've got guests coming to my house. Give me some food. And actually, he didn't say that. He didn't say, give me some food. He didn't even say, give me some bread. He said, give me three loaves, not two, not four. I need three loaves. It was a specific request. What did James say? You have not because you ask not. So many times we pray and we never ask God for anything. We don't. Sometimes we fall into the habit of praying in in, in generalities. We pray in general terms, Lord, please, please, please help everybody get saved, Lord. And Lord, bless all the missionaries and Lord, heal all the sick and Lord, forgive all my sins and and meet all my needs. God wants you to get specific. God wants you to get precise. We got to get specific with God. Hey. You want somebody to get saved? Pray for them and call them out by name. Call out the name to God. You want to pray for the missionaries? Great. Pray for specific missionaries. And better yet, go to your pastor, get a hold of the missionary letter that that missionary sends. 
find a need, a specific need that that missionary has and pray for that specific need. That would be even better. You know, pray for the sick people. Okay, our bulletin is full of sick people that you can call out by name. Confess your sins. Be, be specific. You know, God doesn't expect you to remember every sin you've ever done. But guess what? Or even the, every sin you've done in the last week. But even though, re, call to mind what you can. Remember what you can. Tell them what you do remember. We need to get in the habit of telling God exactly what we need. And how, how really can you do this if you don't track your prayers? Unspecific prayers are powerless prayers. And it's an insult to a God that loves people. Next command is to pray in confidence. Pray confidently in faith. One of the biggest hindrances we have in our prayer life, and we don't actually think about this, is we pray with low or no expectations. Have you ever been guilty of praying to God for something, but then at the same time doubting he'll actually do it? Praying to God for something at the same time thinking in the back of your mind, this probably isn't going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of that. I'm here to tell you. I'm not proud of it. But I've done that before. Guilty of praying with low expectations. James talks about this. James 1, 6 and 8. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. James says, if you're going to pray and not believe that God can actually answer your prayer, you might as well not waste your breath. Because God's definitely not going to answer it. Do not expect anything from the Lord. If you don't pray with faith. If you don't pray with confidence. Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and... He's met by a father whose son is possessed by a demon. And the disciples and the apostles, they were unable to cast out the demon. So the father asked Jesus to cast out the demon for him. Matthew 17, 15. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. Think Jesus was happy about that? He was not happy about that. You know why? Because a few chapters earlier, he had given the disciples the power to cast out demons. He had given them the, the, the power to perform this miracle. They couldn't do it. So Jesus cast out the demon. A little later on, they asked Jesus why they couldn't cast out the demon. And Jesus told them, because you have little faith. And he rebuked them for their unbelief. They failed because they didn't believe that God could do what he said he was going to do. That's why they failed. They were powerless because they were faithless. I mean, do we actually expect God to do something? Do we expect God to move when we pray? Or are we just going through the motions of praying? Scripture's clear that God acts according to his will and his purpose, but at the same time, he commands us to seek him in prayer. Remember, you have not because you ask not. And remember, prayer is not just about what we can get from God. Prayer changes us. Prayer does something to us. It changes us from the inside. Um, often in my prayer life, my, requ my prayer requests begin to change the more time I spend in prayer, because the more time I spend in prayer, the closer I get to him and his his motives, his wants becomes become my wants. We got to start asking. We got to start asking God to do and then expecting God to do. 
We have to pray in faith, fully confident that God will answer that, that prayer request according to his will in his time. We have to have faith in that. And then the, the command to pray constantly. That's the next one. The command to pray constantly throughout the day. This is the last one. Yes, we need to have that time, private time, where we get alone and pray. But that's not the only time we should pray. One of the shortest verses in the Bible teaches us the essence of prayer. And it's 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Three words. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Some people read that and say, man, how in the world can I do that? How can I pray without ceasing? How in the world is that possible? How can I drop everything and pray all the time? And through the centuries, there have been people who have taken this to extreme and lived as monks in, in monasteries. And, and they removed themselves from society. And they shut themselves off from the rest of the world. And they do nothing but pray. But man, that's not what the scripture is suggesting. It's not the example of Jesus. None of the New Testament believers did that. It's the, in fact, it's the exact opposite of what Jesus and the apostles did. So what does that mean? Pray without ceasing. Well, we looked at the model prayer last week. That's our formal, dedicated time of prayer each day. But that's not the only rule we have to follow when it comes to prayer. When it comes to this thing of praying all the time. To pray all the time, it means to begin the day with our Father. Establish that connection with God. And keep that connection throughout the day. And throughout the day, when you need direction, ask Him for it. Throughout the day, when you need wisdom, ask Him for it. Throughout the day, when, you, when you're tempted, ask Him to deliver you. When someone provokes you. Ask him to help you keep your mouth shut. You know, ask God throughout the day. Me and Emily used to go to college with this couple. And, oh, they were so in love. And every once in a while, we thought the dude was kind of cray-cray. Because we find him talking to himself. And oh, who's he talking to? And then we figured out he's got a little Bluetooth in his ear. And he'd be over in the guy's dorm with his Bluetooth in the ear saying, I love you. And she'd be over in the girl's dorm, I love you too. I know I love you more. And, they, and this all the time, they never hung up. I mean, from the time they woke up to the time they went to sleep at night, they were on a constant call. And they only, the only time they stopped their phone call was when the Bluetooth died. And even then they'd switch to the phone. But they stayed on the phone all the stinking time, talking to one another. It was sickening. Sickening stuff. Well, guess what? Guess what? That's praying. <laughs> That's praying without ceasing. It's keeping an open line and open communication with God and speaking to him Regularly, Like there's a Bluetooth in your ear. It's just a, a direct connection. You're always connected. I'll give you one more example. I had a professor in college named Brother Warford. Brother Warford, when he prayed, he would never say amen. He'd never do it. Because he's like, I'm not done praying. In Jesus' name. And then he'd walk off. He'd never say amen. Because he took that seriously. Pray without ceasing. Now, I'm not telling you not to say amen. But that's something that he did to represent in his life. That he prayed without ceasing. Next week, we're going to close out C for communication. And then we'll begin on the letter L. Which stands for learn. So let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Dear Lord, these truths that we've picked out of the word of God today on prayer. Lord, each one of these these commands of prayer have a biblical truth to back it up, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we take these truths in our lives and we, we meditate on them and, and we chew on them, Lord. And we consider them and 
we begin to find way. I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring these commands back to our mind throughout the day tomorrow and this, this week as we attempt to implement these commands in our prayer life to the point where they become a subconscious thing, to the point where they become habit, to the point where we do them without thinking about them, Lord. Prayer is so, so important. Most of the problems the Christian church has today is because we don't pray enough. Lord, help us to get closer to you in prayer. Bless, bless everything we've got going on. Bless those who are on their way home tonight. In Jesus Christ's precious name I pray. Amen.